<laughs> my wife, Beth, uh, supports my habits. She's a school library media specialist. And today, school has already started in her school system. They have children, let's see, they've had children since last week. I think Wednesday was the first day with kids. So she's already started school, and I thank her every time she brings home a paycheck for supporting my habit. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm, I'm serious. And then we have uh, one daughter. Her name's Katie, and she's a pastor's wife. They minister down in Mississippi. Katie and Peter are down there. Peter's in seminary also at Wesley Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. Two grandbabies, Ella and Noah, and they're at my house in Kentucky now. They arrived about 6 o'clock tonight, and I left about 7 o'clock this morning. And I'll tell you the honest truth, I was crying much of the way. My kids live in Mississippi, so I don't get to see them every day. won't get to see them again until Thanksgiving. But I reminded God that I had made up my mind to do His will a long time ago, and He's called me to minister in His name. And I am here with mixed feelings tonight. But I'm here to minister the word of the Lord to you all. And then I have a son, Nathan. He's married and is a pastor on staff as a youth pastor in Port Huron, Michigan, Hillside Wesleyan Church. And he was in Lexington, Kentucky for about a year and a half on staff at the Church of the Nazarene. And so we've got all our bases covered here. Okay? <laughs> but I praise the Lord for His goodness. Our scripture lesson in John 19. If you're able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word beginning with verse 16 the reading through verse 19. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him. And two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the words that speak to me so profoundly from that passage, and they crucify him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence tonight for these precious people who love you, who love Camp Meeting, who love the Word of God, who love the message of scriptural holiness. And we're here to proclaim it tonight. God being our helper. I pray, Lord, you'd meet out to every one of us that portion of truth that we have in need of in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We see the symbol of the cross everywhere. I was in Walmart today and I saw it in a tattoo on a lady's calf. A cross. We see it in tattoos. We see it in jewelry. We see it on t-shirts. We see the cross on greeting cards. We see it on churches. We see it behind me. On the walls, all around the sanctuary. It's a symbol that dangles from earlobes and necks. It's emblazoned on t-shirts and it's even in ink on flesh. It comes in various forms and modifications. Some of the symbols are very plain. Others are embellished. Specific cultures and people groups have their own. Their preference. Did you know bikers have a cross? The French have a cross. Cajuns have a cross. Germans, British, Coptics, Ukrainians. Saint, there's a St. James cross. There's a French Lorraine cross. Even the field of medicine has its own variations of the cross. This spring, I heard our college president <coughs> preach a message with the same outline that I'm going to share with you tonight. And it so, so stirred my heart and my mind after I heard Dr. Spees preach, this, preach a message with this same outline in chapel, that God led me to a message of my own using the same outline. And I want to talk to you tonight about embracing the cross and the various postures, three postures that the Bible talks about we must assume if we are to embrace the cross of Jesus in its completeness. Sometimes I see people with cross symbols on them and I think, do they even know what it means? You see, 2,000 years ago, if people had worn a cross, it would have been a shock. It would have been a horrifying, startling moment to see that emblem on anyone. Because a cross was not a symbol of honor or beauty. A cross was a symbol of shame and disgust. 
Now, the cross was an ancient method of torture long before the Romans ever developed it. The Persians initially used the cross as a tool of capital punishment. Then the Romans borrowed that cross, and as the Romans were wont to do, they perfected the use of the cross in the most excruciating agony possible. Crucifixion was used to eliminate the dregs of society. It was for the worst. It was for the thieves. It was for the insurrectionist. Now, as we understand in, in biblical times, apparently a socket was dug into the ground and a vertical timber was erected there. And the vertical timber had a slot in the top for a cross piece. And a cross beam would be fashioned to fit into that spot. But before it was lifted up, it would be laid on the ground. And as the cross piece was laid on the ground, the, the victim who was about to be executed would be laid on top of that cross piece. They would be taken and then the, the nails would be driven right at the heel of their palms. And they would be attached to that cross piece and then it was typically winched up into position. And once it was winched up into position, you can imagine the excruciating pain and the, the tearing of flesh and the, the pain as the muscles were attacked by those and the, and the nerves were attacked by those nails piercing through the wrist, just at the heel of the palm. And then the crucified would have their knees slightly bent, and the nail would be placed through their feet as the feet were crossed. And once the victim was erected in that position, they were said to be crucified. It was typical that people who were crucified would be hung that way to die for days on end before they would eventually expire. The Hebrews had an issue with that. They believed that once a person died, they should be buried the same day. And so the Romans made a concession to the Hebrews, which was to allow all throughout the land of Palestine, they allowed for the, those who were executed on a cross by crucifixion to have their legs broken. And the process of breaking the legs was to prevent the body on the cross that was crucified from lifting up on those flexed knees and getting an excruciating gasp of air into the lungs. As they hung there on the cross, their blood would become thick and coagulated, and the heart could hardly pump the jello-like substance of blood until they eventually would gasp their last breath and die. So the Romans allowed the Hebrews to break the legs, and that way the person would expire more rapidly and they could go ahead and get them into their tomb. All this the Bible describes with the simple words, and they crucified Him. And thus was the horrific death of our Lord. You know, I've thought about it often, the sins that our Lord bore upon Him at the cross. He bore the sins of Hitler on Himself at the cross. Can you imagine the grief of the holy, sinless Lamb of God, the Son of God, consciously aware of the murderous rampage of a man some 1,900 years later who would kill his kinsmen. He bore the sins of Hitler. He bore the sins of Stalin. He bore the sins on the cross of Nero who would slaughter Christians by the thousands and tens of thousands. He bore in Himself the sins of Jeffrey Dahmer. He bore in Himself on the cross the sins of Jared Loeffner, the Tucson assassin. He bore in Himself the sins of politicians and preachers and drug addicts and child molesters and unfaithful spouses and the whole world and it's summed up in these simple words, and they crucified Him. I'm talking about the cross. And the incongruity of it all is that as Jesus is crucified, He turns to His disciples throughout His ministry, and one by one and over and again, He calls them to a cross. And he 